Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to the worship of God here at Westminster and ask that you take the pew pads that can be found at the end of the row, sign your name, and pass it on down to those you are worshiping with. In the pew racks, you'll find prayer request cards. If you have a prayer request, we ask that you fill those out and uh, hand it to the ushers as we sing our second hymn. Also, if you're a first-time visitor, there's uh, visitor cards that can be also found in the pew rack, and we ask that you fill those out and place it in the offering plate when the offering is taken. We have one really big announcement, and that is, it's a flapjack Sunday, and this is a great time to just have fellowship, have some great pancakes. It's free. We do take a free will offering. Um, and I think that's a great thing. And so it, give as you feel led and uh, enjoy a great breakfast. The cause for this time's flapjack breakfast is our uh, pay down the mortgage quicker fund. And so just know that it goes to a good cause if you hang around for flapjacks. Are there other announcements? As many of you know, last weekend, about 12 of us from Westminster Presbyterian and DeKalb went to Decatur, Illinois. And at our largest number, there were about 15 of us serving in Decatur in various capacities. We worked at Good Samaritan Inn, where we packed over 270 lunches for folks that were coming in for a hot meal. And they got to take that lunch with them. We worked at Jubilee Farms up in Clinton, Illinois, which is about two and a half hours from DeKalb. And that is the second church farm. So an ordained minister actually runs the farm. And we actually, what did we do there, Sarah? Uh, we did um, like clean like the seeds in like little containers. Which tied in perfectly with the t-shirts that Sarah designed. Sarah, do you want to model the uh, t-shirt? And on the back, she's got all the names and they are being planted Ooh. and growing in various places. So we thank the congregation for their support and uh, we'll figure out a way to share more stories from the weekend we spent last, last week. Thanks. Good morning. I just want to point out in your bulletin um, that next Sunday at 11.30 there'll be a forum on the inclusivity statement. Um, this is kind of an informational thing to let you know what session we'll be considering. So I'd encourage everyone to come. And what time would that be? 11.30. Can I read that out? Okay. Yeah. Let's stand and greet one another. Please join me in our call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing.
please be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us join in the prayer of confession and confess our sin to God. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forget what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image, through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And all God's people say, God of mercy. You are full of tenderness and compassion, slow to anger, rich in mercy, and always ready to forgive. We ask this in the name of the one in whom our forgiveness rests. As God's own people, be merciful in action, kindly in heart, humble in mind. Be always ready to forgive as freely as God has forgiven you. And above everything else, be loving and never forget to be thankful for what Christ has done for you.
please join with me in our prayer for illumination. Gracious God, you have placed within the hearts of all your children a longing for your word and a hunger for your truth. Grant that, believing in the one whom you have sent, we may know him to be the true bread of heaven and food of eternal life. Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 29, verses 15 through 28. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Our response comes from Psalm 105, and we will read it responsively. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. The covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac. Saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as a portion for an inheritance. Praise the Lord. Turning to the New Testament, <clears throat> our readings continue in the book of Romans. The Apostle Paul addresses the church at Rome and writes, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. 
we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then turning to the Gospel of Matthew, we read selections from chapter 13. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field when, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls on finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous, and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The word of the Lord. If you have a prayer request, we ask that you hold it up for the ushers to collect as we sing our next hymn.
You may be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is a good thing that we come to your word this day. Open our hearts to receive its message. Help us turn in ways that please you, to serve you more fully. Strengthen us by what we hear so that we may live more faithfully for you and better show the light of your message to the world. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, I spent all last week at church camp, and it's always a dangerous thing to send your pastors off to, well, revival. Um, it was, it was a great week, and I want to share some of the stories I heard along the way because they were really uh, poignant times for me, and hopefully I can share a little bit about how much they meant. Uh, the first story is a story that comes from just conversations with another pastor. He was very active in his presbytery, the regional group of Presbyterian churches, and they were going to a small Presbyterian church trying to um, see what they were doing to revitalize themselves. They lived, it was a church in a small town, and it was a small town that had faced lots of decline through the years. And so they just asked the church, you know, what are you doing to try to strengthen your congregation? And the answer came back, well, we're waiting for the train to come back. And I thought, you know, how poignant and how hard it was to hear that message and, and also how odd it sounds to us. Um, I am sure that place was a much more vibrant town when they had train service and they had all the things that that meant. You know, you had passenger trains coming through and so you could have a hotel and you probably had workers on the train line that were part of the church. Um, I remember early in my ministry uh, just serving as a supply pastor in a church that actually had a stained glass window that had a train in it because they knew how much that train meant to the town. And they were waiting for the train to come back and somehow revitalize their community. And it, to us it sounds so odd to hear him say that. But as I thought about it, I've wondered if sometimes maybe we're in that very same place, that we are waiting for those things that have revitalized us in the past to happen again. We are waiting for those young executives coming to the Cal bag that bring their families in, and those families help give vitality to our congregation. We are waiting for those young staff members to come back to NIU and those staff members bring their families in and help revitalize us. Um, but last I checked, they closed the Cal bag. And last I checked, many of those vacancies for staff at NIU remain unfilled, that they are being filled not with full-time faculty people that come and move to this community, but part-time adjuncts that live somewhere else and commute into this town. And so if we look at the people who are actually in the cow that come to our community, maybe that would be a place to start with revitalizing our own life. And rather than waiting for the train to come back and for those young executives and for those staff people to find us like they always have in the past, maybe we need to figure out who's here and make sure we know how to serve them. So having said that, I have a horrible story to tell about myself, and bear with me, because this is embarrassing, and I'm just going to tell it. Um, it was years ago that I had a chance to work on a video project uh, about John Calvin, and of course, since this is the year we sort of historically start 
the Protestant Reformation. We are 500 years from that time, and there were a number of events at uh, church camp that sort of remembered the Protestant Reformation. And I even taught a class about John Calvin and his role in that Protestant Reformation. And as part of making the video about John Calvin, I had a chance to talk with the church historian, Dr. Martin Marty. Uh, Marty's a very, Dr. Marty is a very famous figure in Chicago, taught at the University of Chicago for years, and uh, he's been out here to give lectures many times. He's really a, a delightful man and, and great to get to know. And we had done this interview with Dr. Marty about John Calvin, and I, I remember thinking when we were done, um, he understands the nuances of our tradition so well, and he's so knowledgeable about John Calvin for, and then I was listening to what the end of the sentence was, and I was about to say, for a Lutheran. And I thought, wait a minute, what, what am I saying? What am I thinking? Of of course anyone can master our tradition if they just study it. And why would I think that he couldn't possibly understand it? And the truth is, uh, prejudice is real. Even stupid things like that, stupid denominational level labels, they, they're just, they're, it's just real. It's real and it's part of our world and part of our life. And one of the stories that happened to me at Synod School was the story of the book that we listened to, um, Driving Out. I mean, it's in Storm Lake, Iowa. Maybe some of you have been across parts of Iowa, but there's like a cornfield, and then there's like another cornfield. And that's what you're looking at for, boy, yeah, it's a long drive. Anyway, so we're listening to Trevor Noah and his book, Born a Crime. Uh, Trevor Noah is a late night talk show host and, and he's uh, South African. And uh, he's, his father was Swiss German. His mother was uh, native African from South Africa. And uh, so he is light skinned. And he lived in a place where everyone, everyone was black. I mean, that was the nature of apartheid. His mother was black. That was who he lived with. And everyone was black. And he talked about the odd ways that um, he was given benefits because of the color of his skin. Uh, he had been playing with one of his cousins, and uh, in the course of the play managed to puncture her eardrum. And of course, the traditional way of reminding children not to do things in South Africa is to give them a hiding, which is just, you know, kind of shorthand for wailing on it for a while. And so his cousins got a hiding, and then his grandmother was getting around to doing it for him, and she didn't. And uh, his mother got home and said, why didn't you spank the boy? And it, it sort of came out, well, I, I don't really know how to spank a white child because don't they get bruises and stuff and their color, to, uh, the skin changes? And uh, Trevor thought this was great. <laughs> and another story he told was in uh, South African homes. In this, this tribal area they lived in, whenever there was a funeral, the whole community gathered uh, for dinner. And if you were part of close family, you went in the house and you got the best stuff. And then if you were just part of the community, you, you were out in the, in the front yard or in the street and you, you didn't have quite as good of food. And he said that the whole time they went to funerals, he always got to go inside because he was the white child. And he said, you know, I suppose I should have stood up and said, 
isn't this just kind of institutionalizing the privilege of our oppressors and perpetuating racism in our country? And uh, shouldn't I really not use the color of my skin to gain access? And he said, I was seven years old, and I liked the cookies. Um, it's possible that we like the cookies. It's possible for those of us who have never had to give it another thought that because of the color of our skin, maybe our society is skewed in such a way that we get some advantages. And we like it. And so we don't have to think another thought about it. But maybe we should. Um, I've got a quote here from John Wesley. And uh, in keeping with my earlier statement, of course, Wesley was the founder of Methodism. And it turns out he was really smart for a Methodist. So let me read this quote from John Wesley, and it goes like this. One great reason why the rich in general have so little sympathy for the poor is because they so seldom visit them. Hence it is that according to the common observation, one part of the world does not know what the other suffers. Many of them do not know because they do not care to know. They keep out of the way of knowing it and then plead their voluntary ignorances an excuse for their hardness of heart. You know, it's possible for all of us to know a lot about how our society is set up, uh, set up to give privilege to certain races and to not deny it for others. It's possible for all of us to know that, and yet somehow it's easier for us to ignore. And I want to say unequivocally that we're in a place where we can't ignore. We have neighbors next door, so close. We have neighbors that worship with us who could tell us a lot about how life is so much different. For folks who don't have the privilege of a certain color of skin, and if we're going to grow and truly represent the gospel, uh, we not need to hear that story and not plead the voluntary ignorance that is so commonly the case. Um, our preacher for the week was uh, Dr. J. Herbert Nelson. He's the stated clerk of the Office of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. This represents the highest elected office in the Presbyterian Church, and he is a man of impeccable pedigree for that office. Three generations of Presbyterian pastors in his family went to a Presbyterian college, went to a Presbyterian seminary, got his doctor's degree from another Presbyterian seminary, served upper class churches, served poor churches, served for a while in our Washington office for the General Assembly where he said, you know, my job is to plead the case of those statements our church has made that says we should think about what our social policy is as a country. Uh, and I would also say just a terrific preacher. Um, we are going to invite him here. Who knows if he'll ever show up. And maybe sometime we'll show him up on the screen because he was, it was so much fun to listen to him. Um, he's also black, and uh, he was in Storm Lake. It had been late night. He'd been listening and talking to people all night, and uh, he was driving to the Walmart to get some something he'd forgotten, and uh, he was stopped by the police. Um, for no real apparent reason, but it just looked odd. Uh, a black man in this white community in a rental car uh, 
the police officer felt compelled to pull him over. He said the officer was very kind and truly stressed this was a non-event. I'm used to it. Hmm. So anyway, we should remember those texts that we've had a chance to listen to this day. Those texts that remind us about the power of the gospel that we have to proclaim. Paul reminds the church in one of the great chapters in scripture that says, who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn. And it's a reminder that we have constant intercession by a God who loves us so. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword. And it's a reminder, especially for those who find themselves on the short end of society's stick, that there is always still hope, and there always still is God's goodness holding us up. And then I've always thought, what is Paul thinking by this short quote he sticks in here from Psalm 44? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. And finally, um, in working with this text, which I've worked with many times before, I made it a point to look back at Psalm 44. And Psalm 44 is almost unique in the Bible in that it says, God, we have been faithful. You have done it wrong. Why are we suffering on account of you? And Paul quotes that passage, and then he says, no. No, it doesn't work like that. It works like this. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What a great promise to have. And what a great thing to have the chance to say. And as we think about the vitality of this congregation and about our life before God, the great thing we have to say is that whatever our circumstances and whatever your circumstances are, you know, maybe you had the misfortune to be born a Lutheran or be born a Methodist. And no matter what, you are more than conquerors through the one who loves you. And that's part of what we have, the hope. And then we've got all those great promises that come to us in the gospel lessons today that tell us about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like something that's tiny and yet it grows despite itself. And then having told the, the parable that way, he makes sure to tell it from the point of view of a woman. And he says, you know, it's like the yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. And it's a reminder that not only does the kingdom grow, but that it can affect everything, even though it's just a tiny little thing. And then he keeps rolling on these images. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, and so, our gift of the gospel is this great gift. And so when we talk about church, we don't just talk about, well, come to church and we have pancakes. Maybe we could say something about, come to church and we have Jesus. And that's a really good thing. It's a thing that fills our life with the most precious thing we can have. And the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
And so here he tells a story that resonates with both men and women. Men can figure out the value of a good investment. Women know what good jewelry is about. You know, that's kind of a stereotype. Sorry about that. But he's telling the story for everybody that's listening. And it's a story that says, come to the kingdom. You're going to find something great here for your life that is the most precious thing you can have. And then he tells this final odd parable that goes like, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. And it says, you know, right now, catch all the fish. Leave the sorting to somebody else. And that's part of the message of the kingdom, too. Catch all the fish. We'll leave the rest to God. Um, one more story, and I'll quit. Uh, I taught my usual class on Calvin, and uh, if you went to the Lenten soup suppers, you heard all the stuff that I had to say. I didn't miss a thing. Congratulations. Yeah, that was great. Um, but one thing I made a point to do was to start all my classes with a prayer from John Calvin. And he has an interesting expression that doesn't even show up now in our prayers. And it goes something like, it says, the good God. And then he closes all prayers with the expression, may it be so for all nations and for all peoples. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our prayers this morning, uh, there's a prayer request uh, from Bob Hadley and asked for prayers for my cousin Sally Wallace, who is facing very serious health issues and a prayer request to remember Mike Hart in prayers. He's scheduled for uh, shoulder surgery on August 4th at Del Norte. So, Mike, we certainly do remember you. With these concerns in mind, let us come before God in silent prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we offer before you the prayers for those we have mentioned and for those who have been named in the silence of our hearts. 
hear us as we offer our prayers to you. And now as our Savior has taught us, we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Let us offer our gifts to God. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen.
and now go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each one of you from this time forth and forevermore. And all God's people say,